And we're live. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucy Gray, and welcome to Actionable Innovations Conversations. We're joined uh, with three of my friends today to talk about adventures abroad. Um, and we are excited to have you here with us if you're joining us live. If you are here uh, for the live taping of this webinar, we would love for you to jump into the chat and tell us who you are, where you're from, um, and share a Twitter URL or a LinkedIn URL if you want to connect. Um, this is meant to be a networking event and an opportunity to uh, connect with our speakers. So um, we would love for you to jump in and say hello and tell us who you who you are. I'm going to remove the the banner that's below there for a minute. Uh, because it's covering up Karen's face, and that's not good. <laughs> There's Karen. Hi, Karen. Um, uh, Actionable Innovations Conversations is a project from Actionable Innovations Global, which is a professional learning community that um, Don has been involved with, I've been involved with, and a number of other people. And what we do is we connect and empower education-focused professionals worldwide through international professional learning and networking opportunities. And our aim is to change the world by providing meaningful and impactful learning experiences for all learners in support of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So that's kind of our mission. And um, our next big thing after this, um, after this webinar is going to be our annual conference, which used to be the Global Education Conference. If you Recall that we I did that with uh, Steve Hargan on for a number of years, and now we call it GLOW or Global Learning for an Open World, and that will be happening online in Hopin uh, November 13th through 14th. And Jesse, one of our guests today, will also be one of our keynotes. So um, we hope that you will join us then. There is a link to register and a QR code to register. We're accepting proposals through November 1st if you're interested in presenting. Um, it's going to be a really great event. We have about eight um, fabulous keynotes that are spread out throughout those two days. And we've got several, I don't know, maybe 25 sessions already scheduled, um, general sessions as well. Uh, a couple of people are also doing this this year are doing a couple of in-depth workshops um, that are going to go longer than our typical 50 minutes. Um, so we're excited about that too. So if you're interested in connecting and um looking at things from a global perspective, GLOW is, is the event for you and we'd love to have you come. Uh, so um, join us. Um, so today uh, we want you to participate and be active if you're listening. Here's how you can connect with us um, on social media. This link tree slash actionable inno will lend you, will take you to a variety of resources where um, you can read Don's writing or browse our resources, our, our curated global education resources, or whatever you'd like to do. Um, but here's our, our link for that. Um, we'd love, again, for you to uh, introduce yourself in the chat, um, comment, ask questions. Um, this is really an informal opportunity to kind of get to know some new people. And you also are welcome to share things on social media with our hashtag, actionable NO. Uh, so today's guests um, are, are intrepid travelers, and this is one of my favorite quotes, and I thought I would throw it in. Um, the world is a book, and those who do not travel read only a page. Um, and this is in maybe maybe our world is changing where we're not going to be necessarily traveling as much physically because of sustainability issues. Um, but I think that it being being able to travel um, virtually too is 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 worthy as well, and um, and these people uh, Don Buckley, Karen Blumberg, and Jesse Wise are three friends who happen to go to um, they all went to Bhutan not together necessarily this summer, and uh, Karen and Don also were in India, and they're going to tell us a little bit about their experiences. And we're also going to learn about um, Jesse's organization, GEO, which does a lot of teacher edu uh, teacher travel programs. Somebody I know from Chicago has gone on like six or seven of his trips, and um, they look phenomenal from what I can tell. So you're, we're going to talk about their summer experiences, um, and then we're going to move into talking about a little bit about, um, about GEO and how you can get involved in, in that sort of thing. 
So um, Don, do you want to start out with our uh, one of our, we usually do an icebreaker um, kind of convers kind of icebreaker uh, question uh, modeled after um, the Proust questionnaire in the back of Vanity Fair magazines. And, and Don, what's your, what's your question of the day today? Uh, today's question, um, and I'll give it up first, we'll give people time to think, uh, is one of my favorite. What words or phrases do you most overuse? Ah. So, so a bit of the history, uh, welcome everyone, I'm Don Buckley, a bit of the history on uh, the Proust questionnaire. It's a set of questions that was designed by Marcel Proust and um, it, it, it became really popular as a parlor game in Victorian times. A bunch of interviewers still often use it today and I've just taken it adapted slightly for education. So the question I chose today is, um, and please if you're online as well, uh, well I should say if you're not, with us here physically, please ch chime in and put in the chat. What words or phrases do you most overuse? For me, it's awesome. I say awesome all the time. I feel like I'm a 12 year old when I say that. And um, the other the other phrase that's been that's been bothering me that I don't use, all I do use sometimes is um, fair enough. That's I've been hearing people say that left and right lately. Fair enough to everything. And um, when they, and I don't know why it's popular all the time, you know, all of a sudden, but it's kind of like y'all that you're, the phrase you use, Don, all the time is y'all. Um, anyway, that's my personal pet peeve. I, I know I need to stop saying awesome all the time. And I wish everybody else would stop saying uh, fair enough. How about you, yeah. uh, Don? Lots of my over, yeah, y'all, amplify, orbit. Yeah. I love saying in my orbit, they're in their orbit, you're in your orbit, amplify, <laughs> amplify, amplify. So they're my ones, yeah. And just what you said about fair enough, I'm yeah. thinking of Karen's one, which she always says, good enough. That's when she called me, it's good enough, Don. It's good enough. <laughs> but That's a good thing I do. I think good enough is, is important for people who are a little, um, like me who get, you know, want to get everything perfect. So I think that's not a bad one. Karen, what other ones do you, do you use all the time? You're, I'll unmute you. There you go. Um, I, I knew it. I can, I actually can't stand when people say you're muted. Um, <laughs> uh, the, it was nice that you had an action phrase instead of that. Um, I was going to say, awesome. Um, I am trying very hard not to say sorry. Uh, and I don't overuse it so much, but I, I work at a girl's school and uh, I'm just constantly encouraging them to not apologize. You know, like plenty of people in this world do things and don't apologize. And sometimes you don't have to. You just have to acknowledge that there was a problem and maybe you weren't the reason for it. So especially then don't apologize. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so and I've noticed in terms of pet peeve ones. Uh, that was one as well, but all I think about are pe more pet peeve ones. My sister can't stand when my mom says, not a problem. Not yeah, a problem. yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem, yes. There's a very nice man that works in my building, and he says it all the time. And so part of me thinks, I know he's just being kind, but I also remember that he drives my sister crazy, and thus me as well, because I can't, you know, we're similar enough. I think when you're at a restaurant and, and your waiter says, and you ask for water, and they say, no problem. No. Yeah, that that drives me nuts. Yeah. So anyway, Jesse, how about you? Are there any phrases that you use uh, constantly? I have just come to the conclusion that I'm not self-aware uh, because <laughs> I just can't think of anything that uh, that I believe I overuse. Um, but I'm sure my wife and colleagues might beg to differ. <laughs> Uh, that's a good conclusion of being self-aware. Um, okay, so for uh, if anybody else is here and would like to um, be self-aware and share a phrase that you overuse, we'd love to hear it. Um, but typically, we start out with these um, questions, and and I'd rather hear from our guests tonight. So we're not going to do more of them, but um, I'm going to take away my slides for a second, and um, and uh, uh, Don, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? And then I'll turn it over to you guys in a second uh, with your slides. Yeah, uh, I'm Don Buckley. I'm a world traveler. And I teach D 
design thinking and entrepreneurship at Marymount School of New York on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And I also teach a design thinking graduate class at Teachers College, Columbia. And Karen? Uh, hi, I'm Karen Blumberg. Uh, I'm currently at the Brearley School on the Upper East Side of Manhattan in New York City. And uh, my current title is the Tech and Innovation Coordinator and I'm overseeing two spaces one is lower school centric and the other one is middle and upper school. So just trying to get people to use the spaces to do uh, projects, creative projects, um, and passion projects, really. And I, too, travel the world like Don. And Don, um, Don, once upon a time in 2006, hired me and has been my friend and mentor ever since, even though we no longer work together. That's it. And uh, I have to and I met them, too, just to add my two cents. I met them. Um, uh, Pam, uh, I can't remember Livingston. what her, what her Livingston. Livingston at the time. She wrote a book on one to ones, uh, laptop schools, and and I was in New York probably for the first time since I was a kid in 2007 for a Google event, and um, I made an appointment with Don to come see the school at Columbia where he and Karen were, and that was um, how I met them and Andrew Gardner, who also worked with them, and. Um, they are my brain trust. Um, when I come to New York, I, I love hanging out with them. Um, Jesse, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself too? Sure. Uh, I'm Jesse Weiss. I'm the executive director of GEO. Uh, GEO is a 501c3 nonprofit. Our whole goal is helping teachers travel and then bringing those experiences back to the classrooms. So we're here to recharge teachers' batteries, give them amazing trips that they can afford, get them professional development credit and graduate credit while they're traveling, uh, and then provide an educational framework for the whole program so that it's easy for them to translate the experience into their classroom so that their students benefit from them traveling. And how did you go, how did you start, Gio? Because you're not an educator by trade. Your story sounds really interesting to me, and maybe you want to share it with everybody. Uh, so I was a film and, and photography, well, a film major, and I started shooting photography for a tour company. So I shot their catalog in Nepal and in India and in Borneo and Vietnam and Thailand while I was still in college. And wow. then I fell in love with travel uh, through that. And then I started a consulting company in Europe. I ran that for four and a half years. So I lived in 16 countries in Europe for my 20s and then didn't find that fulfilling and wanted to help other people travel. So I started GEO back in 2007. And so since then, we've had over 4,500 teachers travel with uh, GEO to something like 70-something countries at this point. Wow. And you're also a disc golf player. Is that it? Yeah, I'm an ultimate Frisbee player. And I'm also, I write about disc golf as my weird hobby that takes up too much time. That's awesome. That's great. Love it. All right. So... Let's let's jump into this. Um, Karen and Don, I'm going to put your slides up. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how you spent. Oh, that's, that's, that's uh -huh. the wrong, is that the wrong slide deck? Where'd your slides go? It's a yeah, slide. You, you just skipped through it. That's it. You just need to go back to the okay. star. OK, sorry. Um, so how so how did you spend your summer vacation, um, Don and Karen? Uh, I mean, I started in Thailand. That's my home away from home. So when my wealthy students talk about their country houses, I say, my country house is Thailand. Uh, yeah. My best friend uh, lives there, my best, uh, 30 years, and she's half, uh, she's Thai. Um, so I started off in Thailand. I met Don and his wife uh, in India. And then we all, the three of us went to uh, Bhutan and to participate in Fab 23. I then went back to Thailand and then France and then back to the school year. Um, because I can. It's, it's so nice to have friends. I always tell my students, like, make friends in other countries, and they will be your, uh, you can stay with them, I mean, make good friends, and be a good guest, and stay with them, and have a built-in travel agent, and uh, it's the best way to be. So uh, I found this conference because I got a million emails from Fab, uh, the Fab Foundation, and they have, they, they meet up in a different country every year. They had a hiatus because of COVID, but they're back, and this was their big, um, you know, welcome back to the Fab event, so they were hosted in Bhutan. And for months, I was just ignoring these emails. Like, why, what? Um, it didn't even occur to me to go. But then I thought, wait a second. I do have a professional development budget that's pretty generous at my school. Maybe they'll let me use those monies for this trip. And it turned out that the conference was assisting people with getting the visa. And the best part of it is the conference 
made it so that the, uh, the, the daily fees were waived. Tourists have to pay a fee. What, Don, it used to be $65, right? But then- 40, it went, 40 or 60 or something like that. And then it went up to $200 a day. Uh, so, and, and basically like that tourism fee that, uh, it, it, uh, it pays for infrastructure, it pays for education, it pays for, you know, the welfare of the people, which I really respect. And I was joking that it's like the Midtown congestion pricing plan in New York city, that they want people to pay like 20 something dollars to enter Midtown by car. And then that money will pay for programs around the city. Um, anyway, so we, we decided to go and we were able to be there for two weeks without, Having to pay two hundred dollars a day to be in the country. That's um, great. First slide. You've just been going through it. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I'm like talking. Yeah. Okay. You you want to talk about the Fab Foundation, Don? Yes. Yeah, so um, Fab twenty three, which was in Bhutan this year, um, comes out of MIT, a spin off of MIT. Um, there's a professor Neil Gershenfeld that runs and, and founded the director for Bits and Atoms. And a spinoff of that is the Fab Foundation. And I put their mission up here that you see, which is very noble and amazing. And, um, you know, people in the audience are probably very familiar with the word Fab Lab. It's thrown around everywhere. Well, Fab Lab is, are actually labs that are approved by the Fab Lab Foundation. So not every Fab Lab is what it is. In fact, the only fab lab in New York City that I know is at Marymount School in New York, which was brought in by James Deck, who was, you know, very close with his foundation. But anyway, that's, they organize a conference yearly. And um, that's what uh, brought us there was to that conference. And I, I showed a, a quick uh, map earlier so that you can see where Bhutan is in it bordering China and, um, uh, India, a, a lot of people, you know, th th you know, there's two camps. There's the camp, oh my God, you were in Bhutan or what? Where's Bhutan? You know, it's like one of those countries that people just don't know. And I don't mean to be a snobby traveler, but back in 2007, I was in Sikkim, which is, uh, which is part of borders Bhutan in the north of India. And um, we, we tried to cross the border, my wife and I and two other friends, but they had closed it uh, because there were elections. And since 2007, we've been saying, let's go to Bhutan, let's go to Bhutan. And this was the opportunity to do it since Karen spotted the conference. And um, she, she was talking to my wife, Leah, they're good friends. And Leah said, why aren't we going to Bhutan? And so we did. We applied for visas and went off to Fab 23 Bhutan. Um, um, and next year it's in Mexico. So we're going to try and go as well. It's in, uh, yes. Just so you know, Pueblo, Mexico. Yeah. So just about the conference, these were the sort of main themes that were in the conference, uh, which the whole, it's the whole time, this conference went on from July 16 till July 31st, right, Karen? But the first part was a challenge, right? We, 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 the, the conference is split up into four portions, uh, and the first portion was the challenge. And, right. and you had to apply to get onto a challenge team, and I was told there was no more spaces, so I didn't get one. So to this day, I'm slightly annoyed. So now I know to apply early if I do want to go to Fab Mexico, because being on that challenge team meant that you had an extra, you had extra time in the country to make a connection with a group of people. So now you're suddenly networking towards a common purpose. And the challenge teams did a bunch of stuff, including we'll talk about later. There was this one team that was focused on weaving and kind of modernizing a, like a loom that could be easily transportable so that the, the his, you know, this really historically important concept of weaving uh, and, and the traditions of weaving in Bhutan is dying out because people aren't teaching, uh, the older generation isn't teaching the younger generation. It's also really female centric and, and it's a bummer because why aren't boys learning weaving? So this challenge group did some really cool stuff uh, and I'm, I wish I'd been part of it. I have FOMO. Sorry, Dan, go on. And then the, the, the Fab Learn, the Fab Festival was the first thing that we joined. We actually flew from uh, Kolkata on July 19th. Our visa would allow us to stay in the country July 19th through July 31st, which is when we left. Um, and, and so this is the first part. Before we uh, went to the conference, we spent time in the Punaka Valley. We'll talk about that in a bit. But this was um, the, 
the conference. And then this was the main conference and symposium, which was on July 24 through 27. And then there was the Fab, Fab City Summit on the 28th. And then after that, we went off again and did some more touring. But this was the location of, it's a super fab lab, which we'll talk about later, where it was in Timpu, which is the capital of Bhutan. And that's just a, a part of the uh, yeah. fab lab. This picture is to just show that I was like, what's a super fab lab? And it turns out it's a, it's, it, is, it has bigger machines that can actually make the smaller machines that most of us are used to seeing in fab labs. And also, as Don said earlier, fab, saying the term fab lab, it's just like you get the seal of approval from the Fab Foundation, which you have to apply for. So most schools have maker spaces or innovation hubs, and they cannot use, they can't say it's a fab lab. But I thought it was pretty cool that this was a super fab lab because it had like even bigger, more expensive machines. Oh, so yeah, we started off our trip in Punaka, the Punaka Valley. Uh, that was a picture of the royal family. Um, and so the king, not the current king, the current king is the son of Cloris of the former king. The former king uh, uh, had, he married four sisters. So all of their children were cousins, siblings, sibling cousins, like sister wives. And so I just thought that was awesome. And so the, uh, the, the current king is, I think the son of the second wife, he's the firstborn son. And there's a picture of the Punaka Valley, which is this, the winter residence. There's tons of monks. Oh, Don, uh, 700,000 people, right? Yes, a population of 700,000. Size-wise, for our American audience, it's about half the size of the state of Indiana. For a global audience, it's slightly smaller than Switzerland, which I can relate to because Ireland is twice the size of Switzerland. So there's our uh, measurements. For 700 people in the entire country, like that's like half of Philadelphia. I can't even picture it. I might even be a third of Philadelphia. But this is the Punaka Valley. And of the 700,000 people in the country, there's a ton of monks. And they they migrate to Punaka for the winter months. And then they go to, do I have that back? They winter in Punaka. Oh, yeah. And they summer in Timpu. So we started in Punaka. Can, are you, who's doing the slides? You or I am, you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's, oh, and yeah. then. Narrow Can road. I just say, like, look, I mean, is that not incredible? Look at that landscape. It's mind blowing. And, and I, this... remember, I remember watching your pictures in, in um, looking at your pictures in Instagram and, and there was in the airport, there's kind of a, a recreation of, is it that of that city? Is it? They have the songs and yeah, the, the, songs. And, and the uh, luggage retrieval, which is really <laughs> amazing. Uh, amazing. It's a, amazing. It's a, Tiny airport, but it's like an Epcot Center version of a country because, like, there's beautiful artwork on the walls and examples of like, uh, uh, like artistry with the wood and the paintings. It's gorgeous, and yeah, like mini models of cities and zongs and uh, religious and cultural things everywhere that you look. It's incredible. So, like, tiny roads that were kind of terrifying as we went up and down hills because the country's in the foothills of the Himalayas. Um, let's. I, I was terrified at your pictures of climbing oh. the, to the tiger's nest. Oh, that was, yeah, that was crazy. Um, also, lots of animals on the roads, like tons of cows, dogs, cats, monkeys, you know, we'd have to slow down. And, oh, when our driver gave us a funny thing, he said that, um, I can't even remember, something about cats and dogs and cows, that cats run away because they didn't pay the fare for the taxi and dogs bark because they didn't get their change and cows take their time because they paid full fare. Like, he's like, yes, that's a joke we all tell. <laughs> and I think he thought we'd laugh, but we did. We, I mean, yes, it was charming, but not funny. Yeah. So that slide you guys are looking at is a Zong, which are, these are all over the place. They're like administrative centers. But we eventually figured out that if we were going to either a Zong, a temple or a monastery. So it, all of those three O's were the experiences. Um, and we did many of them. And yeah. really, that's what, if you go to Bhutan, you know, you'll be Zonged, templed and monasteried and uh and then you'll trek everywhere you know but here's a, a, a one an amazing one valley the zong, what, the zong is the center of like bureauc the bureaucratic center the cultural center and the religious center of each of the districts and i think there's like 19 districts 22 something um we came out of the punaka zong like this is the first two the second day we're in we're in uh bhutan and i bump into a former Brearley student yeah who was there on a, a summer exchange, uh, not as an exchange, uh, doing a summer program to learn more about the uh, gross national happiness product and also to learn about Buddhism. And I was floored, like I recognized her and she had just graduated a few years ago. 
Um, so here's examples of the rice paddies in the Punaka Valley, tons of rice paddies. Um, there's adventure tourism. We went rafting. Don fell out and I saved his life. I fell out. Someone caught me by the legs. I was dragged downstream. It was, <laughs> yeah. I, but you know what? I didn't mind. I wasn't even frightened. <laughs> oh, and ironically, right before we flew in, we flew out of uh, Kolkata. Before Kol uh, Kolkata, we were in Varanasi. And in Varanasi, our tour guide took us to Sarnath. So this mound, this is in India. This was on our week before we got to Bhutan. That's the site of Buddha's first sermon, like however many hundreds of years ago. And so I was, it was a really hot day. I wasn't so interested because I was dehydrated and, and sweating out my life blood. And, um, but it was pretty cool. And I took this picture because I was like, I guess I should document the moment, but this is the location. And then it turned out that a week and a half later, we're in Bhutan and it's the day that they're celebrating, they're celebrating the anniversary of Buddha's first sermon. So what are the chances that we just saw the site of it? And so we end up at this monastery up high. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? Like we went to so many places that were super high up on the mountains, like clutching to the edges of, of the mountain. So we traveled along this funny little road uh, walking. We got to the monastery. It's full of the monks that are still in the Punaka Valley rather than the other monks that go to Timpu for the summer residency. And um, it's just beautiful. Like, and then they welcome us. They give you uh, the the tea and the, these munchy stuff. And um, and they were really kind. There's no pictures allowed inside, but like everybody was kind with, about us standing around and, and witnessing like the musical parts and the chanting parts. Um, while we were in a city nearby Punaka, we learned about this uh, Druka Kunli. This uh, I just think it's hilarious. But I also feel bad about thinking it's hilarious. It's not entirely respectful. So in this particular town, they have a fertility temple and they honor this guru that um, he, he, he shot an arrow and the arrow landed. And he said, this is where I'm going to preach Buddhism. And it turns out that his version of preaching also entailed like fornicating. So he's like the, the, the he had over 5,000 encounters with women and he, they called his penis the thunderbolt of flaming wisdom because he vanquished demons with it. And it's, everyone talks about it super calmly, which is hard for me because I teach middle school and I have to fight the urge to laugh. And it, cause, and it's also new to me. So I love the idea of going somewhere else in the world and learning something new and different. Um, but anyway, it, it, there's all these signs that say this isn't pornographic. It's spiritual. So I, I felt like I was getting a lot of reminders to just like be mature. Um, so I love this shot of Karen's. It, it's it's one of their depicting one of the national sports. These guys are playing darts. Yeah. And the other one is archery that is very popular there. But we just stumbled upon this. It was right next to the hotel we were staying. And um, yeah, it, it was incredible just watching them throw darts yeah. <laughs> at these targets. It's amazing. Yeah. And that was a field of wild cannabis. That, That's um, a field of wild I did, Yes, it was pointed out. Um, okay, so then we went from Punaka to Timpu for the conference. We had that weekend beforehand. We stayed here at the hotel right next to the clock tower. There's a clock tower in the center. And beyond in the hills is the Golden Buddha that we went to later. Um, we were obsessed with how people dressed because I mean, I've seen different costumes around the world and, you know, casual dress. And um, the men wore this, uh, like kind of like a robe cinched and folded in the back in a very special way. Don had training and had to wear one. Um, what was that called? I'm already forgetting. Uh, uh, we had, I know the coal, the goal. I mean, Jesse, do you know what they're called? The traditional, I've forgotten. Goal? Anyway, um, I'll look it up while we're talking. And then we went to visit the big Buddha. We, uh, this was, this was part of that, uh, a, a, a weekend of massive, um, importantness, the Buddha sermons. So we went inside and we saw a lot of chanting and we had, a, we sat cross-legged, um, just to reinforce that bamboo scaffolding is all over Asia. Um, oh yes. So, uh, remember we, yeah. You want to talk about what we did there, Don? Yeah. So this was, um, one morning and, uh, it, it was just a little walk from the hotel, but it was uh, where people go to pray. And so they just keep walking in circles around this, what's the name? I don't know what it's, it's not a oh. temple, but it, they- uh, it's, a, it's up there, it's a stupa, but they, it's a chort stupa. temple. Yeah, they call stupas chortons. Right. And it's vital. people just keep circling it. Some of them have prayer wills, some of them don't. And it was just fascinating to stand there um, of course, again, when you came in here, you were offered food and all of this, you know, the, the welcoming thing, the tea. 
which was really hard for me because I can't drink chai. So I had to, I always had to refuse it, but they had water, which is great, you know. Um, but we spent a, quite a while in here just uh, taking pictures of people and, and watching them. I'll, making circle, you circle the, you circle the, the structure uh, clockwise over and over and over. And people were doing like their daily walks. But if you go back to that picture, actually, the men wore goes. That's pronounced go, the national dress for the men. And the women are wearing kiras. The one on the left is wearing a full kira. It goes from shoulder to ankle. And the one on the right is wearing a half kira. So it goes from waist to ankle. So uh, uh, Don's wife and I spent a lot of time looking at fabrics and, and buying stuff. Um, thanks, Don. So, so, so quick question about this. Um, so Don and I were talking about how Bhutan had the distinction of being one of the happiest countries in the world and that happiness index is part of the happiness factor. And any, any of you can answer this. Is it part of it is the spirituality that it's that they're taking time and investing in their spiritual life as well as other yes. parts of their life that makes it this way? Yes. yes. And I think part of it is having low expectations and I'm not being funny. Uh, I think that if you don't expect a ton and you don't expect a lot of money, you don't expect a big house. And part of this is encouraged by the king who himself lives in a modest structure for, for royalty. Um, that if you just have lower expectations, you will be pleasantly, uh, you'll be more pleasant. You won't, you'll be happier. You won't be so greedy and, and disappointed. You're satisfied with what you have. They have more quality there, I think, than you're used to seeing in a country. One of the things I noticed is I didn't see abject poverty. And I also didn't see any BMWs. I didn't see any yes. Mercedes Benzes, which is very strange in a developed country. Normally, there are some very, very rich people, and then almost everybody else is poor. And in here, in Bhutan, it, you don't see that. Uh, our, our, mm -hmm. our guide told us um, that if somebody's homeless, the king just gives them some land. Um, and they've got a lot of land, uh, and they don't have that many people. So you know, it's, it's possible to do things like that in a place like Bhutan. So I think that's one of their advantages is that they, they yeah. have such a small population. And they, they take care of everyone. They do take care of people. During the pandemic, when a lot of people were staying home, um, alcoholism, it turns out, is the number one cause of death. Alcohol is very cheap and tons of people drink there. And, uh, and uh, domestic violence increased as a result of people being home and drunk. So the queen, the current queen set up shelters so that uh, anyone who was facing violence at home could go to the shelters and they sent um, counselors to the home to interact with the person that was causing the violence. So it's like, I mean, that's really thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. And I think um, when we think about problems in the U.S., um, you know, how can we provide a customized approach to that sort of thing? Um in order to help people, I, I I think the the effects of the pandemic are still we're, we're we're are still being wrought upon our society, and we have to think about some ways of um, intervention that are that that like this. I think. Yeah. Also, the the, the they they treat their king like a god. That's what we heard many times from taxi drivers and restaurant workers and hotel workers. And the, they told us again and again, all these stories about how thoughtful they are and uh, schooling is free and, and the new, the kids are learning English. We got along the entire time by only speaking English. I've never traveled abroad and not tried to learn certain words, you know, like to be polite, hello, goodbye, thank you. There wasn't any need, like no one even taught us any Bhutanese words because it was just all English all the time, which was weird. Uh, it, it made me feel a little funny, like, but at the same time I was grateful. Yeah, their their classes are in English. Uh, our, our guy told us so. They are really you know focusing on that. And one thing about the king, um, the previous king before him, I think he was the fourth king, right? Are we on the fifth king right now? If mm -hmm. I remember correctly, uh, the fourth king, he he uh, voluntarily uh, brought so, democracy. Yeah, he set up a parliament. Yeah, and to some, our, our, the way our guide described it, and you never know, you know, exactly if you're getting the exact truth, but he said that the, the king kind of forced democracy on the people, that the people were pretty happy just having a king, you know, running everything, and that the, that, 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 uh, that the fourth king, uh, it might be, it might be the third king, I'm, I, I don't want to get my kings mixed, mixed up here, but the, but, and then he pretty soon thereafter retired, 
and his son took over. And so he retired at a pretty young age for- uh, He so. retired 35 years later. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, 35 years later, okay. He, took, he was young when he became, when he was yeah. thrown. He was 16 when his father died and he took the throne when he was 17. And after 35 years, he's like, that's enough. You need a new young voice for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And we learned that that king, the, the last one, not the current one, had a five, had seven five-year plans. So imagine, like imagine if, if like other countries followed suit. Now it's so much easier when you have such a smaller population and smaller country to deal with. But I, it just seemed like he was mad, like marvelous and really just so revered, but also smart and super innovative. And he was willing to prototype. I mean, these are the words Don loves. He was agile. Um, and also he traveled, the current king too, and the last king, they spend their entire year traveling the country, visiting their popula the population, visiting each of the zongs in each of the districts, meeting the people, and also addressing issues. There were landslides, mudslides while we were there because of the weather, possibly climate change, and the king was constantly just going to each site visiting them. He wasn't throwing paper towel rolls either. He was just visiting the people and seeing how he could help. So sorry. Oh, and that's, they only have one, there's no traffic lights in Timpu. They just have this guy who was kind of like voguing as he directed traffic. It was beautiful. We watched that for a while. Yes. Yeah, so I remember we were there and Karen was like, oh my God, look at the guy directing traffic. And I'm like, we've seen it in Pyongyang, you know, so that's the other place where I've seen where there is no traffic lights in Pyongyang. And it was the exact same setup. And because Lee and I have traveled to North Korea, um, it was the exact. So I was like, oh, well, I've seen it. But but it's obviously very unique because usually you see traffic lights wherever you go. Uh, prayer wheels, I, just spinning the prayer wheels everywhere. Um, and then what's next then? Uh, we went, yeah. Well, we started the conference. The start of the conference. So this was the Fab Festival. So in the town square at the clock tower, everybody there was a bunch of workshops and booths and it was pretty cool. Uh, and it's funny because um, we were talking to a friend of ours who's like, oh, I bet there was a lot of 3D printing. And it was. There was a lot of stuff that just showed like 3D printing and laser cutting. Um, but there were some cool science projects that students were, 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 they were the ones speaking about their work, which was nice. I love talking to students. Um, and then, uh, yes, an exact topic. Oh, the weaving. The weavers made that. That was part of the, the challenge group was like, oh, at the festival, let's have a big weaving loom set up so we could, you know, have a group, a group weaving project. Um, so that was the square. And then there's a group of girls that are all dressed the same in the next slide, I think. Yeah, we just, the, that's the Kira. So we love that. Um, and then that was us. The first day of the conference, they anyone who was Bhutanese was required to dress uh, formally and, and and everyone else was invited to dress. So we went shopping and got some stuff. Um, so there's Don and his go and, and Leah and I are wearing our Kira and then the jacket that uh, you're meant to clash, which is perfect because I don't know how to match any clothes. This is wonderful. Um, that was the location of the conference at that super fab lab, which is named after the king or the prince. I, I think it's the prince. Um, and then uh, it was a big tent set up and then there was the stage at the front. And then I just thought it was interesting that in the Fab Lab, uh, every, it looks the same as every other maker space and Fab Lab that I've been to around the world because I visit a lot of them in schools and without. So embroidery machines and 3D printers. Um, and oh, they, there was a making a geodesic dome, um, a laser cutting, screen printing. Uh, and then this was a fun workshop. Uh, this was a French man who brought this heat press. So then on the next slide, yeah, he had he had uh, uh, ground up bits of plastic, the, the kind of plastic that won't kill you if you breathe the fumes. And um, and then we were remelting it into artwork. So I, and so it was like a nice. I love the hands on activities. And so just getting ideas for what I could do with my students. Um, this was a that was a workshop. If you go back down. Um, they were taking little solar toys and then taking them apart and reforming them into um, solar prayer wheels. Because we also saw some uh, water powered prayer wheels later on. But I just thought that I, I missed this workshop and now I'm jealous. So I have a picture of it. Um, and, and then the next, this was supposed to mimic what the next slide is, like an actual prayer wheel that you, you spin. Um, and then uh, we love this. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, she's from MIT and she was... And I can't remember. You said it so well when we were talking yeah, about she, she she's working on um, repli replicable materials, so materials that just replicate themselves. And it it was like fascinating workshop. Um, we actually brought some of these back to New York thanks to Karen. I was willing to just leave them behind. But here's Karen and I trying to assemble these structures. And this was just a modeling exercise. Obviously, this is will be done automatically in, in, in her lab when she's doing it. Yeah, um, and then the fabric and the weaving 
And then uh, watching Women Loom, I'm trying to fast forward this because I realize we're hogging the mic. And then that's the box, that's the project that the weaving group, the challenge group put together. So it was like a, a laser cut box and kid and inside uh, was a, inside, what's the thing that goes, okay, forget it, just keep going on. Um, and so this was the workshop that I volunteered to assist at, which was the greatest part of my trip, was working with students uh, who came in um, because the weaving group organized it and teaching them how to use this loom, sim totally simple cardboard loom, making these bracelets, tying them off. And then and that was the highlight of FAB for me. So in terms of what Jesse, I probably will talk about, like the ideal trip for me, I did some uh, what edgy tourism before. I went to South Africa and I trained teachers in educational educational technology. Like that, all I want to do is talk to teachers elsewhere and get and share ideas. Um, we fin we finalized the trip by going to Paro. So I, which is, it's beautiful. There's the Zong of Paro. Uh, we went to a microbrewery because it turns out they, uh, that's a burgeoning business there. Uh, we met the guy who was super nice and we had a tasting and then Dom was inspired to use lager as his wordle starting word, which I thought was hilarious and it's worth including. So forgive me, Jesse, if you think that's a waste of time. Um, and then keep going on. What do we have? Oh yeah, we climbed up the tiger's nest, which was a really challenging climb. It took us a long time. And I was the youngest of our trio and they were bounding past me like gazelles, Don and Leah, and then our guide. And all the monks were going up, old ladies were going up. This is a picture I took that I thought was the finest of my trip. Um, and that's a hydro powered prayer wheel. So there's a stream going through that hole beneath the structure and um, it makes it spin. Oh, and then uh, there were prayer flags everywhere and each color represents something else. And the white ones are memorials for loved ones. And as we were at Chela, Chela Pass, um, which is the highest point um, in the country, or uh, we saw a family assembling the prayer. They were digging holes and they were uh, latching the flag onto the poles and burying the poles into the ground. And they included us and shared their chai tea with us. Everybody shared their chai, it was so kind. Um, uh, masala chai, excuse me, chai tea is uh, two words that mean the same thing. And that's a nunnery that we went to, which was also on the side of a cliff and entailed another climb that was treacherous. That was unbelievable. I mean, the fact that I, I came back on skate, I'm still thinking about, I mean. <laughs> these, the trek trek from, the, from the pass to, to the nunnery? Yes. Yeah, yes. That, that trek was great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, yeah. did you know you were going on a trip? Yeah, yeah we, we hiked from that pass that we, where you had the pictures of those flags yes. all the way to here. It was like a did. three hour hike, two, two and a half hour yes. hike. Yeah, it, it was just gorgeous. And unexpected. Uh, in my case, I had no idea what was happening. And we just kept walking. And then there was parts where we had to traverse a, like a little waterfall that was slippery and there was no railing. And I was, I was just like, what are you trying to do? Like, what if we die? Like, what's going to happen then? Good luck. Um, and then, so yeah, that nunnery was fabulous. And then that's us at the airport getting ready to get out, get out of Dodge. Yeah, that's the uh, driver on the far right and our tour guide. They were amazing. I mean, <laughs> right? They just were fantastic. Truly so generous with their time and their care. And they took everything. They were just so serious about making sure that we were happy and safe. Which And it was great. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for letting us uh, talk about it. And Jesse, thanks for being so patient. No problem. Um, I guess I can, I'm going to try to present. Yeah. Let's see how that works out. I'm clicking so, that. So Jesse, while you're getting set up, mm -hmm. how um, I'm going to remove the, the um, slides so that you can put something up. How does this, how does their experiences contrast with yours in Bhutan? How, what was your, why were you there? What were you doing? It, it, it was it similar uh, well, can you see my screen now? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, because I have to add it to the stage. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay. okay. Now you can see my screen, correct? Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. Um, well, I mean, what you experienced sounds amazing. Uh, so uh, that, yeah, I wish we could do uh, workshops like that. When we run trips, we basically have to do, we're running... 70 something trips, 80 something yeah. trips a year. So uh, everything we need to do has to be scalable so that we can do it over and over and over and again, and also make it as efficient as possible so that it's affordable uh, for the participants. Um, but, th but this program sounds great. And uh, you know, I, I think teachers should definitely try to look into that. Um, were, you, were you on a geo trip when you went yourself or were you doing this for pleasure when you went to Bhutan? This was a geo trip, so, but okay. it was pleasurable too. Um, uh, I was with uh, 14 teachers, or th sorry, 13 other teachers, and then myself. 
um, some retired teachers, some active teachers. Um, and uh, if you see right here, right in the middle there, this is the the, the, the route that we followed. So we uh, we we came into Paro, and then we uh, traveled to Timpu. Um, and one of the interesting things is there's no room for a runway in their capital. So you have to fly into Paro, which is kind of cool. Uh, there's no no room for runways in large sections of, uh, of Bhutan. Uh, very, very, I think there's like a runway down south, but I don't think there's, there's runways elsewhere. Um, uh, and then uh, we went to the Gangte Valley, uh, and then we went to Punaka, and then we went to Ha, the Ha Valley. And then we came back to Paro and we did the Bumdrak Trek, which is a trek kind of up and above uh, where uh, the tiger's nest is. So that's, that's a full day trek. And then we trek down to the tiger's nest and then back, back down to Paro. Um, uh, so this was a, a 10 day, nine night program. Uh, we were there from July 5th through the 14th. So we just missed you all. <laughs> um, and the price was actually not this price because uh, we ended, this was before they lowered the tariff, the, the tourist tax. So the tourist tax uh, went down by about nine hundred dollars a person. Uh, because wow! They gave, you, they gave you kind of free days if you were there uh, yeah, for a certain sure. amount of days, and they just enacted that right before we left, and we were able to give everybody a big refund. Um, so you can see here; these are all the different activities that were included. Lots of zong visits, lots of temple visits, as you described. Lots of monastery visits, uh, lots of hikes. Uh, so um, you know, I was looking looking at your pictures. A uh, very similar experience to to a lot of the, a lot of the things that we saw. Um, I saw in your picture in your pictures. Um, and then this year we're running a Nepal and Bhutan trip. It's actually on sale, and it's the sales ending um, on uh, on Saturday. Um, it's three thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars per person. That includes the visas, the all, all the fees. And this is a thirteen day, twelve night trip, wow. and it's. Part of it's in Nepal, so it's Kathmandu, uh, Pakara, uh, Chitwan National Park, and then as well uh, going to Paro, Timpu, and Punaka. Uh, so uh, it's it's less time in Bhutan, um, unfortunately, but this was the, the itinerary that we we ran. Our tour operator is not offering next year, so I'm hoping to bring back the the longer Bhutan trip. But this is great if you've never been to Nepal, um, and it makes it much more affordable um, because Nepal is a lot cheaper than being in Bhutan. And it's a nice contrast um, of uh, two very interesting countries and very different populations and di very different government, uh, very different levels of infrastructure. Um, so they make a, a great contrast to each other. So typically how many, your, te your groups are fairly small for most of your trips, right? Like how many teachers, like 15 go on this? Uh, yeah, so that th that was the maximum was fifteen. We we had the trip was full and we had a one last minute cancellation. Um, but in general, our programs are anywhere from fourteen to sixteen people. Um, if you see here on our website, we go. Well, these are some of the, the reasons why teachers travel with us. Our programs are discounted, so we subsidize them from five to fifteen percent off of retail prices. Uh, our average group size is eleven. And our smallest group size is six. So it's always small groups with us. We provide these educational resources, PD and graduate credit. And we also provide customer service that, you know, you have to experience it to understand just how much we care about teachers. Uh, we're a nonprofit. So this is not run like a corporation trying to be as efficient as possible and make as much money as possible. We're trying to teach, uh, treat teachers like uh, the special people that they are and give them customer service where uh, they can reach us pretty much any time and, one ring and you'll reach us, not uh, not not a you know switchboard or anything like that. Um, and this is a our program list on our website. So you can see these are all the programs that we're running in uh, this year in this school year. So it's a lot of trips. Wow. And one thing I noticed on your social media too is that periodically there's scholarships available for students. Yes. And and how does that work? Uh, so we partner with universities, uh, area study centers. So there's government grants uh, that uh, are given to area study centers of universities to uh, do K through 12 outreach in their communities. Uh, so we're partnered with Columbia University has given us $18,000 to give out as $1,000 grants. 
to 18 teachers to go to us with to an Islamic uh, com- country. So, for example, you know, we've got Morocco programs that are about $1,200 for uh, $1,281, there we go, for 15 days in Morocco. So that Bhutan trip is very expensive compared to our, our normal programming. Uh, so uh, we've got, you know, pr- programs to Jordan um, and, uh, and Egypt uh, that are also covered by the grant. Central Asia, we've got a trip that goes to Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Um, uh, so these grants through these universities, you can find the grant applications usually on social media, or if you subscribe to our listserv, we've got a listserv. If you are our homepage and you go right over here, you put your email address and then confirm it. You'll get emails from us when we have new programs, when we have sales and when we have grants available, and then we'll, we'll let you know, uh, when, when those are available. Uh, typically. Um, and then tell us about your tour operator too. That might be helpful. How, how do they jive with your, your front facing nonprofit? Sure. So we work with a very large tour operator called G adventures. Uh, they're one of the largest tour operators in the world. Um, they have, oof, I don't want to quote the number anymore because I kind of lost track, but it was somewhere around 300,000 people travel from a year. Whereas last year we had uh, just under 700 teach, teach people travel with us. So we are a little flea on their back. We're a separate nonprofit, uh, so different company than them. Um, but uh, we've got a very close partnership and we run all of our trips through them. It makes things much simpler on our end and we're getting bulk pricing, which is why we're able to subsidize the trips is we're buying in bulk from a tour company that already has the lowest prices from the industry. It, so this is why the, the trips are as affordable as they are. Um, G Adventures is also a very ethical company. They're a leader in sustainable tourism. Uh, they work with the World Bank. They work with the UN. Uh, so they do a lot of uh, community development with their trips. So they try to do social entrepreneurship. So, for example, in India, for our trips, you get picked up at the airport by a woman, um, but through a nonprofit called Women with Wheels. Or I'm not sure if it's actually a nonprofit. I shouldn't say that. But it's all women drivers. Uh, which is very comforting for people arriving in, you know, the crazy Delhi airport to, to be picked up, picked up by a nice woman with your name on a sign. Um, and then we, there's like a clean stove uh, cooking project in Tanzania. Um, there's lots of restaurants, community restaurants that they support um, that help bring revenue to, to uh, places that don't really have many jobs. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we love working with them. They're very ethical. They're Canadian. Um, uh, and, uh, so it's, they're a very good partner for, uh, a company that, for a nonprofit that has altruistic, uh, intentions. Lucy, you're muted. I know that favorite, that favorite favorite phrase. So what is the feedback from teachers and, you know, like my friend Connie, who's gone on six year trips, obviously loves it. Um, are, are the teachers taking what they learn and do you hear stories of them about applying what they've learned to their teaching at all? Yes. Um, um, so if you look at our website here, it should say classroom you, after answer. We've got to change this. Can you zoom a little bit? Cause it's teeny oh, tiny. You betcha. Okay. okay. Let me find my zoom here. Oh, that's good. Awesome. Thank you. So on our website, we have a um, lesson plan database. We haven't added Bhutan yet because that, that was a new trip and we haven't uh, gone through that yet. But for example, uh, let's just say um, if somebody's teaching about Morocco, um, you can use and you can put in a grade level a subject matter and you can search our database. Um, and so you can see here's an example of a classroom action plan. So every teacher who travels with us has to create a classroom action plan. Um, we ask them to at least. There's no sticks here. Um, and then during the trip, we workshop those classroom action plans, give each other uh, feedback. The teachers give each other feedback. And then in theory, they bring that back into the classroom. We also give all of our participants a Google Earth presentation that's fully scripted. So it's easy for them to share their experiences with their students. And we give them lots of resources. Uh, recommended reading lists. Um, we've got a Pinterest board with all sorts of, um, you know, YouTube videos with with language articles um, uh, about the places they go. So we're we're trying our best to 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 
have the give the teachers knowledge about the country beforehand, help them think about how they can share that with their students when they get back before the trip so they can start planning for that. And then during the trip, help facilitate getting the materials, getting the knowledge they need to, to teach what they want to teach when they get back. Um, I have one more question for you, but Don and Karen, do you have anything that you want to add? No, I just want to ask, Jesse, are, are, do you know reality tours based out of Mumbai? I've heard of them, um, but we've never worked with them. Yeah, they're, I mean, that's who, I know Krishna well. He was attended workshops when I gave them in Mumbai at the American School of Bombay. But we use them uh, for this time in India. I, I mean, Leah used them when I, when I was working in Mumbai. I, I wasn't, but she was blown away by what they were doing. And we found them great. But just when you were talking about, you know, the, the woman coming to Delhi Airport to pick you up, that's very reality tours and how Krishna operates, but they're, they're a great group. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why we work with G Adventures is they have such a large catalog too. So right. we can go to, I think they've got 80 something countries in their catalog and we're going to like 63 of them uh, this summer. This summer alone. Wow. So uh, that's one of the advantages of working with such a large company, but there were some great, you know, I don't know if Reality Tours is an international company or just local. No, it's pretty much um, uh, India. That's that's it. You um, know, a bunch of our travelers, because we run an India-Nepal program, and a bunch of our travelers have used Reality Tours uh, to do um, uh, to, to 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 see uh, some of the slums in Delhi. I, 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 if I'm correct, Mumbai. They're not in Delhi, also. Yeah, so, so, yeah that's it. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, they worked with, um, so I was in in the American school. I went to the American School of Bombay to present uh, at a conference and went on one of the reality tours with Krishna as well. And and one of the people I was with, uh, Jennifer Klein, works with World Leadership School in Colorado, and they have a, a service learning program for students um, through them. And um, and so. Uh, it was so anyway, it was great. It was, it was, it was great to see, but there was something So, world leadership school is, is, a, um, it's not actually a school. It's an organization that does a lot of service learning, a lot of teacher training, PD kind of stuff. Um, Karen, anything else you want to add or say? It sounds awesome. I wish I'd known more about it before I've taken all my other trips. Um, but I do have a friend who said, she said, Oh, I want to, I want to question you about your India trip. I want to do everything you did. And I was like, Okay, but now I will definitely tell her to just go to Geo and check it out. Yeah, fifty yeah. percent of our travelers are women traveling alone, and so that's a lot of teachers are women, and you know, going to a place like India would be very daunting for a single woman to do, um, and that's one of the things that we make easier is we, you know, it's it's guided. You're with a group, and it makes you a lot more comfortable going to a place that might be more intimidating. Um, and we do run trips to Europe too, and it's fun to travel with other people there too. But um, I'd say for the developing countries, I think that's that's something that really stands out is, um, you know, having the comfort to go to places that, you know, you might not be comfortable going on your own and, you know, trying to figure out the travel logistics, we take care of all of that. So for our programs, you're just signing up for the trip, you have to book your own flights. Um, but otherwise, we're taking care of almost all the other details. Do you, do you ever ever have a school that completely that wants to send a bunch of teachers on a trip? And yeah, we, we've worked with private schools before that have run group trips with us. Um, uh, but most of our participants are coming in by themselves or coming in with, we allow them people want to bring along non-educator guests as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can travel with your, you know, with your significant other or, you know, your, nice. your children as long as they're over eight, the age of 18. Um, but like 80% of our travelers are active classroom teachers. So roughly, roughly that. And about 20% are their guests or retired teachers. So I'm going to blow the lid on our, our secret for the conference, but um, we're trying to launch a trip with people from whomever, but hopefully people from our actionable innovations community to go to Iceland next summer. And, and Jesse will talk more about that when he presents at our GLOW conference that's coming up. 
Um, but it's a, is it a seven day trip or a nine day trip? I think maybe to, to Iceland and seven days. I think, I don't know if we chose the, the trip with more time in Reykjavik. Um, yeah. cause we've got kind of two versions of the trip we can run one with not much time in Reykjavik and one where it's kind of built in the, the time in Reykjavik, but it goes all around the island. So this is like a kind of, kind of a circuit doing the, the big circle loop of, of Iceland. Um, it's a packed trip. It's, it's really a lot of fun. So I'm hoping it works out and I'm hoping that we get some enthusiasm, um, you know, and you're getting the, you're getting the early word about it um, here tonight. So um, I know it's dinner time for you guys back East. It's dinner time for me now. My husband is waiting uh, outside my door probably with me right now. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and, and we could talk forever about this because I think there's a lot of roads we could go down in terms of Bhutan, in terms of traveling, in terms of the impact on um, on educators. And and I guess, you know, I think it's time. I think teachers need, you know, one thing that you mentioned, Jesse, is that you want to inspire teachers. And I think particularly now coming out of the pandemic, that uh, this is one way to get re-inspired is to actually go out and see the world and reconnect with people and places. So I hope people will take advantage of these opportunities. Um, if you want to follow up with Karen and Don and Jesse, they can throw their emails into or into the. I can throw their emails into their chat, I, I guess, um, so that you have uh, that information. Um, you can also find them on LinkedIn and other places um, as well. So Jesse just put his into the chat. Karen and Don, if you want to throw your email into the chat, people can follow up with you too. And um, we don't have another actionable innovations conversation um, planned for October yet, but we will have one and we'll announce it soon. And then there is our conference. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing everyone there uh, for 24 hours of goodness. Um, thanks again for coming, everyone. And uh, we'll see you soon. Nice being you, Don. Nice being you, Karen.